so. I wanted to talk to you today about diabetes technology, which is, um, I, I'm from Silicon Valley, so I'm a technolust. I love things that can move us forward. And I think technology has things that can offer very close and, and can happen right away for a lot of people. So I wanted to go back and just review diabetes technology and, oops, go back. And um, 1700 BC, Egyptians were describing diabetes. And of course, then their way of diagnosing it was the taste test. You would dip your finger in the urine and it would be sweet and you can make the diagnosis of diabetes. Now, not a lot of applicants to medical school back then. And it must have been hard when you went home and wanted to kiss your wife and she'd say, I'm not getting near your mouth. But um, so technology advanced and we got to urine test strips. And this was just in the 1900s. And that was the way to diagnose diabetes, but we had no way to treat it. This is a, a child in 1923, and the difference between him in 1923 and 1924 is that he was given insulin. So you took someone that had, at that time, a fatal disease. The Greeks described diabetes as like flesh melting off the body, like wax melts off a candle. And, and it was fatal. It, he would not have lasted much longer without that insulin. The problem, we thought diabetes was cured. Now you had insulin, which could treat the underlying condition that you weren't making insulin. But insulin turns out to have a very narrow therapeutic margin. If you get the blood sugar low, I'm having trouble with this, you uh, can end up with seizures, loss of consciousness, and even death. On the other hand, if it runs high for a period of time, you end up with the complications of blindness, kidney disease, early heart disease, and um, impotence, a lot of problems down the road. So it's a very narrow window that you have to keep the blood sugar in. So we got from urine tests to blood glucose meters in 1977, which was about 30 years ago, and about the same time they begin to develop insulin pump therapy. I just want to show you, this was the first insulin pump by uh, Arnold Kadish. And size actually does matter. And, and this is something that you would not want to wear every day. And this was actually the first pump I put on a patient and, and I wore, and when I turned over, my wife was black and blue. It was called the blue brick. And, and uh, it is a tethered pump and there's a little needle going under the skin. This is a pump that we're using today. Both these pumps were actually developed by Dean Kamen, the guy that um, made the Segway. This is uh, a patch pump. This is my uh, daughter modeling it. And this is newer, smaller patch pumps that are going to be coming around. This is a pump based on MIMS technology, very small, so that this pump, using a MIMS technology can hold 500 units of insulin and be very flat and narrow. So things will get better and easier. The other thing that happened about 13 years ago was the development of glucose sensing and continuous glucose sensing. Up until then, you had the glucose meters for the last uh, 30 years. And they were dependent upon taking a finger poke glucose. You do those four or eight times a day. Again, they're 1,440 minutes in a day, and so you were missing a lot of what was going on, particularly overnight, uh, an hour after eating. You were just missing a lot of events. So continuous glucose monitoring was one of the holy grails we were seeking, where you could see what was happening all through the day. So these are the, the Dexcom sensor. And you notice everyone modeling these subcutaneous sensors has no subcutaneous fat. Um, <laughs> This is the Minimed uh, system. And here you have the, I'm not pointing there. I seem to have lost the pointer, but there is a, a needle uh, that goes under the skin and then the white disc is the transmitter and it goes from, uh, the signal is then transmitted by an RF signal into the uh, pump. And so on the pump, you can then see your glucose values and the pump is delivering the insulin. So now, if you know what the glucose is, and you have a device that's delivering insulin, all you need is an algorithm in between to have a closed-loop artificial pancreas. 
So the algorithms are around, I mean, you can, we can fly airplanes, we can send missiles and have them be accurate. And the engineers can do this. There are proportional integral derivative algorithms, there are model predictive control algorithms, there's fuzzy logic, and all these can work uh, to do this. So what's the problem? Well, the problem in a lot of engineering is time delays. And the sensor can have a 15 minute time delay in actually recognizing the change in the glucose, in your blood glucose. The insulin, when it's delivered, has a 15, 20 minute delay before you really begin to get effective levels. So when the blood sugar begins to go up, sensed by a sensor, the insulin action is a half hour behind. Also, there's inaccuracy of the sensors themselves. There's variability of the insulin absorption and duration of insulin action. And then you introduce uh, things like exercise and meals and the type of meals you eat and how much fat is in it and how slowly they absorbed or rapidly they're absorbed. And so there are a lot of variables that make this more difficult than we initially recognized. But what I wanted to talk about was just a couple of specific instances where this technology I think has a lot to offer. One is low blood sugars at night. They're, um, 75% of seizures occur at night because you're, you're not able to monitor, you're not aware, you can't think about it. This keeps a lot of parents up at night, doing tests overnight. It makes people anxious. The um, diabetes itself is just very, very demanding. And um, for, for parents with young children, um, sleep is also essential and they can't do it without this. And one of the things we did when these new sensors came out we brought people into the research center and did an infrared videotape on them to see how they responded to the alarms. Most people responded about two-thirds to the first alarm, but with each subsequent alarm at night, they failed to wake up. And so overall, only about 71, about 29% of the alarms were actually responded to. So I'm going to give you an example. This is, uh, and in these, uh, examples, the top line is the glucose value in blue, and you can see below that alarms going off when this person's blood sugar went low overnight, and below is the insulin pump, and the insulin is pump is delivering insulin and actually is programmed to give a little rise in insulin delivery when her blood sugar is running low. The result, when she didn't respond to the alarms, was the parents heard her thrashing in her bed and she had a seizure. And if the information from the sensor had been linked to the pump, you could have shut that insulin off and perhaps prevented the seizure. This is probably the worst case scenario. This is someone who, you can see the little blue boxes at the bottom was delivering insulin because they had a high blood sugar before they went to bed, or midnight is when they went to bed, and their blood sugar dropped overnight. They failed to respond to it. This is a 23-year-old guy, and he was living at home, and the parents found him dead in bed the next morning. And this happens. It happens in the U.S. It happens in every country. So the first product that could come out would just be to take that sensor signal, hook it to the pump that's delivering insulin, and tell it to shut off if the blood sugar is low. This is called the low glucose suspend. It's um, actually made by Medtronic uh, Minimed. It's a DL pump system. It's sold in every country that they sell a pump in the world except the United States. And uh, so it is uh, available. And hopefully in the next year or so, uh, we will get the studies done to allow it to be sold in the United States. This is an example of how it works. You can see. The blood sugar went low, it suspended for that two hour period there, and the blood sugar drifted up so they didn't remain low. If you hadn't shut the insulin off, the blood sugar would have stayed low for that period of time. And at the end, two hours later, the blood sugar is 140, 150, pretty reasonable glucose value. So one of the things we've been working on, we have algorithms to predict when the blood sugar is gonna be low. So instead of waiting till you get low to shut it off, look at the rate of fall, when you're gonna come down and then shut off the insulin delivery. And we've done these type of studies in uh, a, a lot of inpatient cases. And you can see in this case, the blood sugar is going down in green. You can see the pump shut off and then we restart it and it prevents the blood sugar from getting low. So what we do now 
is once the blood sugar is past the nadir and coming back up, we just restart the insulin infusion. Uh, we just completed um, our last set of eight uh, subjects, and Denver's going to be doing another eight. And our next goal is to move this to the home environment. And um, this is taking the, the sensor. It talks to the pump. The pump talks to a little computer at the bedside, which people just have at their home. And, and this thing will have this algorithm. And it will turn the pump off and then turn it back on again. No alarms. So you can sleep through the night. The only alarm if you get below 60. And so it's just to provide that safety overnight. Um, we're, we submitted to the FDA in the next two weeks. We should hear whether we can proceed with that. We have some NIH funding to do that. This is another scenario. This is a, if you can see at noon, which is right there, well, I, I can't point here, but the blood sugar is going up where that red arrow is. And what happened is this boy, adolescent boy, forgot to give his insulin dose. And this is a major problem. Diabetes is really demanding. You've got to count carbs. You've got to remember to give insulin. You've got to do the blood test. Lots of tasks all through the day. And if you're a dude and you're hanging out and your friends are talking to you, you may do the blood test, but you may forget to go ahead and give the bolus. And this happens to about 60% of kids. It happens in general a couple times a week. Two missed doses raises that A1C by half percent, which increases their risk of long-term complications. So why not, the same as when the blood sugar was going down, we turned off the pump, why not turn on the pump when the blood sugar is going up? As you can see, this kid was up for the next 12 hours after that one missed dose. So this is the controlled range where you prevent insulin delivery when you're dropping, and as the blood sugar is going up, you start insulin delivery to compensate for that. This is a uh, multi-center study. Um, we're one of the centers doing it. It's international. These studies have already been done abroad and in Virginia and UC Santa Barbara and we'll be starting next month and Denver will be starting next month on these studies. So I just want to go back to the islet cell which you've seen many times today. And the islet has the beta cells but it also has the alpha cells that make glucagon. So if you really wanted to replace the islet, maybe you'd want to replace both hormones. So um, there's also amylin that's made, and people have talked about adding that also to the artificial pancreas. So this is a group out of Boston, uh, led by Ed Damiano and Steve Russell and Feroz El Khattab. And they have an artificial pancreas where when you see the blood sugar going up, you see the blue strokes at the bottom, that's insulin being delivered. But as the blood sugar is coming down, the little red strokes are a pump delivering glucagon. So they have two pumps, one delivering insulin, one delivering glucagon. So as, as you need insulin, it's delivered. As your blood sugar is dropping, you release glucagon to prevent lows from occurring. This is uh, Ed, and this is his little handheld controller that he's showing, which will control both pumps. And he's very... They're doing studies now in children in the inpatient setting, and they hope to be moving into an outpatient environment with this system. So we've been doing studies, in what, and uh, Stuart Weinzheimer at Yale has been doing studies in a, what's called a hybrid closed loop, where the patient could go along, give insulin for a meal, and then if they forget, the system is kicking in. The system will kick in if they're not in their target, um, but they can also have the chance to give a pre-meal bolus. And that gets rid of the time issues in covering a meal, if you can give the insulin ahead of time. So we'll have kids give 75, 80 percent of what they're planning to eat ahead of the actual meal bolus. And one of the areas we thought this would be important is at the onset of diabetes. And this was a study that was funded by TrialNet and DirectNet. DirectNet does a lot of glucose sensing studies and TrialNet does a lot of um, prevention studies. And one of the things that's clear is that the onset of diabetes, you have a fair amount of islets left. Well, okay, so our goal was that if we could keep the glucose values near normal, 
it would protect those islets. That islets do not like a high glucose. There's this thing of glucose toxicity. If you culture islets in a high glucose, they die early. If um, islets are exposed, and this is a place with the, with the transplant surgeons where we could control the glucose when islets are first transplanted to give those islets a better chance of survival. So a lot, when people are first diagnosed, they have maybe 20% of their islets left. If you look at them, the re honeymoon phase is due to recovery of existing islets, and then there's about 10, 15% of, of new islets being made in that recovery phase. This is a picture of glucose values in a child right after diagnosis. And you can see there's a lot of variability, and this is each one of those lines is a day. It looks like a Jackson Pollock picture, and a lot of highs, a lot of highs after breakfast. And this is the girl that holds the record for the most days on an enclosed loop, I think, uh, Gina. And she was on for four days at the onset of her diabetes. You can see all the uh, DVDs it takes to do that. And this is her glucose values a week after she went home. These are her glucose values two years later. She's actually a student at UC San Diego. And she's here, right there, and this is her birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> and uh, we, we've done now, this study we, we've enrolled, uh, now we've completely enrolled in the study. There are 44 patients that have received the intensive care and 22 controls. You can see their glucose values not only lasted, were improved in the inpatient setting, but it continued when they went home, and our goal is to see if we have prolonged the honeymoon. So there's, there's a question when we make these things, how many sensors does someone need? Uh, what uh, uh, types of um, sites should we use? Um, the system should detect the onset of eating, detect sensor failure, detect infusion set failure. And then there's the issue of real estate. And I, all my studies are done with people that volunteer like Gina, and we can't move forward and actually, until we actually do these studies in people. So this young dude, he's wearing two sensors. He has a utility belt, a pump, and it's a lot of hardware to wear, a lot of skin issues to wear. And when I talk to these kids, they want to have one thing that they're wearing. Not, they want the sensor and the pump combined, and they want the thing on their belt to be one thing, which will measure the glucose, and give insulin. They also want it to be their cell phone, their MP3 player, <laughs> their game player, and to give them access to the internet. So what should we be doing? There we go. That can talk to the sensors. It can talk to the pump. It would have the algorithm in it. If someone's getting low, it could send off a text page, tell mom that you're getting low. If she didn't respond, it could send a message to 911. It has a GPS on it. It knows where you are. There's a lot you can do. When we do outpatient studies, we can monitor someone continuously in real time to see how they're doing. So um, th I think that's the future for us. Thank you.